Today I'm going to show you what's inside of one of the most basic two-liter four-cylinder engines from Volkswagen. Now this engine is a base model engine using the Volkswagen Jettas from about 2010 to 2015 and it only produces 115 horsepower. Now this engine really doesn't have a lot of features especially for a semi-modern engine so we're going to strip this engine down to see just what you're missing when you order the base model. Now taking a quick look around this engine here we do have this plastic intake plenum which is interesting because it's got these really long runners that curve around the fuel rail and the spark plugs instead of just putting everything in the front. Speaking of spark plugs, this engine's pretty old school because it still uses spark plug wires with a single ignition coil instead of using a coil on spark plug technology like what many other manufacturers have done many years ago. It also makes spark plug access a little bit more tricky to get in. Now on top of that we've got a metal valve cover on an aluminum head and an iron block which you probably wouldn't expect for an economy engine because you'd expect it to be lightweight. This engine isn't even turbocharged to need the strength of an iron block. Now coming across the front part of the engine here you can see there's a lot of aluminum brackets for the accessories that fit on the front and surprisingly we still have a timing belt there is no timing chain in this engine, so you will have to replace that at some point. The water pump is also driven off of the timing belt. And you'll also notice that there is no cam phaser here because this engine doesn't even have variable valve timing. Now down at the bottom here, luckily you can see we do have a spin-on canister style oil filter. There's no cartridge like the newer ones. And at the back here you can see the drive-by wire throttle body as well as a standard exhaust manifold. It's not integrated into the head and there's no turbocharger on this engine. Now we're going to begin this teardown by removing all the intake manifold bolts. We'll just remove this intake. And next up we're going to remove all these wires here to connect the spark plugs. This is some really old technology if you ask me. How are you supposed to do this with the intake manifold in the way? Next we're going to turn our attention to this exhaust manifold and remove the heat shield. Pop this heat shield off. And now we've got to get off these bolts here to remove the exhaust manifold. All right, turning my attention to the front now, we're going to remove some of these accessory brackets. What's a Volkswagen without these triple square fasteners? And this here's where the coolant hose connects to the engine, and we've got the thermostat housing inside of here. Just going to remove the 10 millimeter bolt, and remove the housing, and remove the thermostat itself. That's the standard thermostat. I just remove this bracket here. Next, I'm going to remove the crank bolt. I wonder how hard these are. So I gave up on the crank bolt, we're going to try that later. I'm just going to remove this timing belt tensioner here. Now this timing belt tensioner works kind of like a eccentric guide where the more you turn it, it actually tightens up on this belt here. I'm just going to peel off this timing belt here, remove this tensioner. This is just a spring loaded tensioner here. We have these tabs here that are ingrained inside of the block and that's going to rotate like an eccentric shaft in order to tighten things up. Remove the cam bolt. I'm going to remove these four bolts holding the water pump to the block. What a stupid design, they put the timing cover in front. This is what the water pump looks like. It's got a plastic impeller on it. Next we're going to remove the valve cover. You know they use nuts. I feel like nuts can get lost easily. Interesting, they put this plastic baffle inside of the valve cover. And this is what the inside of the valve cover looks like. There's not even any PCV hoses attached to it. Now, underneath the valve cover of this simple 2 liter Volkswagen engine, you can see things are very straightforward. You got your simple camshaft profiles that are going to touch on the buckets. There's no rocker arms or anything here. It's a single overhead camshaft. There's no exhaust or intake separated. And that also means that it runs a two valve per cylinder design, which means that each cylinder only has one exhaust valve and one intake valve. I really hope that the simplicity of this design is going to attest to the longevity of this engine because it's so simple under here. There isn't even any variable valve timing or anything. This is simpler than those old Corolla engines. I'm going to remove these 13 millimeter cam cap bolts. Then I can remove these caps here. Things are pretty simple and straightforward. I also don't notice any damage here because we don't know the history of this engine. And pop off that single camshaft and that reveals the individual buckets for the valves. Now if I remove one of these buckets here you can see that it's basically just got a spring down there. There isn't really any adjustment that you can do. Now the head bolts are actually somewhere between a T50 and a T55. I've got a T50 in here and I hope I don't strip it because I don't have a T52 socket. But you can always count on Volkswagens for having bolts that are pretty easy to get out and not over torqued. Especially compared to Japanese or Korean engines. Alright now we'll just zip these off. And with all the head bolts removed I can remove the head. Which is so simple and light. And here's the head gasket. 
head gasket looks intact. Now taking a look at this engine, I don't see any major failure points. It's got nice small pistons because this is a small engine. Even the crust that's on top of here doesn't seem too excessive that it was burning too much oil. Now this Volkswagen engine uses a spin-on style canister oil filter at the bottom here along with these oil cooler hookup tubes here to cool off the oil. So I'll just spin this. Oh my goodness. <sighs> I got oil everywhere. Okay, I think this is a piece of my wife's old bed sheet. Doesn't need that anymore. It's been stained enough already. So to get this oil filter housing off, there's these two hex bolts here. But to get to that, I gotta remove this bracket. And this is one thing I really hate about Volkswagen. There's the use of different types of fasteners holding the same thing together. You got a hex bolt over here, and then just a regular socket that would go on here. I'm gonna remove this bracket for the crank position sensor. Then we'll loosen up these tens here. Oh my goodness, there's one hidden one. Okay, I'm going to turn this engine over, quite literally. First, got to make a mess. Of course, it's got to make a mess all over my cardboard studio. I got a piece of my brother's quilt, and I'll just use that to snap this up. So I got a big giant socket on here. I'm going to remove the oil cooler. Here we are. There's the oil cooler. Oh my god, more mess. And now I can take off the oil filter housing assembly from the block. Now this engine uses a stamped steel oil pan and then an aluminum upper oil pan before bolting to the iron block. So there's a lot of different materials here. Now there's a bunch of hex bolts that I'm going to remove going around in order to get this pan off. I'm going to just rip these off with the impact. I'm sure they make a special tool for this called a hammer and a chisel. And there's the oil pan. Now this oil pan looks pretty shallow. There's some milky deposits inside of here, so I'm thinking maybe there could have been a head gasket failure or something. Taking a look under the oil pan of this Volkswagen engine, you can see that we have this metal pickup tube that leads up to this oil pump here, which is chain driven off of the crankshaft. It also looks like we've got a little drain here that brings all of the oil from this baffle back down into the sump over here to be recollected again through this pickup tube. Got a bunch of hex fasteners that go around here that secure this upper oil pan to the block. All right, just lift that upper oil pan away. And here at the front of the engine, we've got this oil pump, which is driven off of this chain, which is driven off of the crankshaft. So I've got a Torx on here. I'm gonna knock this loose here. So that way we can free the oil pump. Kind of interesting how they let this baffle just kind of float around in here. With just one bolt attaching it. And that's it, the baffle's free. Remove the bolts of the oil pump assembly. And there's the oil pump. So you remember how my impact couldn't get this off? I'm going to try to use a breaker bar to jam something in here and see if we can get it out. So I was able to get this bolt free by wedging my engine stand under this car and then I can loosen the bolt so that the engine stand doesn't tip over on me. There's that sucker. And here's what the crank pulley looks like. You can see the harmonic balancer here has got that rubber insert and it also houses the gear for the timing belt. And it looks like I broke the little keyway that was in here too. A couple of torques here to remove this front plate. Just pop this cover off and the timing belt can come off. Now this front piece here just comes off of the block. It also is an aluminum piece. A bunch of 10 millimeter bolts. I'm going to pop off this front seal assembly here. You can see it houses the front crankshaft seal. And then here we've got the little tensioner that holds the oil pump chain on. Now that all the front stuff has been removed, we're going to take a look at the bottom of the engine here. And I don't notice any obvious damages or anything to these connecting rod caps or the bear main bearings. So the next thing we're going to do is remove these bolts that hold the connecting rod caps together. And yet that's another style of bolt. It's an E-Torx bolt. So, so far I've used E-Torx, Torx, Hex, regular socket bolts, six-point bolts. There's just so much different style of bolts here. Connecting rod bearings look beautiful. Just use my wife's toothbrush here to push down on these pistons. Oh my god, so much more oil. I'm going to remove the rear main seal at the back here. Finally, I'm going to remove all these main bearing bolts here. They're 17 millimeter. And then I'll just remove these rod caps. Now all the four main bearings look perfectly fine. No damage to them. And right now I should be able to pull out the crank. So now that I've got the entire engine apart, we're going to take a look at how it works and how simple the systems inside are. So you've got the oil pump that sits here and it's going to supply oil down this hole here. And that's going to supply oil down this galley all the way over here. Now that oil is going to come across 
to the oil filter assembly which is going to sit here where it's going to get cooled down and filtered out and then pass back through the main oil galley which you can see inside of here. Now the main oil galley is going to run the entire length of the block along inside of here which you can see by this little hump here and you've got your main bearings which are going to be drilled down in this direction here which are going to take oil to lubricate the main bearings as well as the connecting rod bearings. Now additionally we can also see oil spares that tee off of the galley at the bottom to lubricate the cylinder wall. Now that main oil galley is also responsible for teeing off and feeding the engine head where it's going to go through this little hole over here to lubricate the camshafts. And that's pretty much it. This oil system is pretty straightforward just being fed by the oil pump, oil filter and everything tees off of the main line. My only wish is that they made this thing out of aluminum instead of iron, especially being an economy engine. Now the crankshaft is pretty straightforward for a four cylinder engine with the only exception being this reluctor ring that'll pick up signals from the crank position sensor so the engine knows it's RPM. Overall, taking a look at the pistons themselves, the oil control rings don't look completely clogged up so I don't think this engine was burning a lot of oil, although there is a lot of crust on top of here, which is normal for any high mileage engine. Also, this engine looks fairly well lubricated. There's a lot of oil in every surfaces and I don't notice any extra wear so I don't think there was a wear related issue with this motor. Now most of the simplicity in this engine is the fact that it's driven by a timing belt instead of a timing chain and it doesn't even have variable valve timing as well as only having a single overhead camshaft and eight valves in total which is only two per cylinder. So if we remove this camshaft here and turn this over now looking underneath here you can see your intake which is going to line up to the intake port over here and the exhaust which lines up to its exhaust port down at the bottom there. There's only two per engine which means that you're fairly limited in terms of complete performance because you can't get as much air in and out as say a four or five valve design. Now also noting the spark plugs come in at an angle with these two cylinders coming in at this angle and these two cylinders pointed in this angle instead of being down in the middle like many other conventional engines. Now I have read that these engines tend to eat a lot of spark plugs and ignition coils and that's because they run them really late in order to maintain proper efficiency because this doesn't even have EGR doesn't have any other pollution control devices such as a secondary air system or variable valve timing so in order to control all that it just runs really really lean and that's why you only have 115 horses. Now looking at the air intake system the only modern technology I really see is a drive-by wire throttle body as well as an acoustic induction system here which has a flap inside activated by vacuum that's going to vary the length of the intake runners. I do have another video on how that works linked above. Now for a German brand I'm extremely surprised at the relative simplicity of the design inside this engine. Everything is very simple and easy and even simpler than say a Japanese or a domestic engine from 20 years ago but I guess that's what you got if you ordered a base model Jetta. I guess that really shows that Volkswagen can put a simple design engine together without that extra complexity that they have in their modern engines with the exception of using random fasteners everywhere. I guess that's what you get when Volkswagen turns to cost cutting and they just kind of go back in time. Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next engine teardown is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.